All right, thanks for the introduction, Felix. Um, so last year I was thinking, well, I guess this year I was thinking, uh, I really want to get a talk into QIP. And the QIP has become so competitive, so you have so many good talks here, and I really didn't know what to do. So you know, I suddenly had this great idea. Of course, I should co-author a paper with Fernando. He always gets tons of talks in. And uh, then I had this other great idea. I should co-author a paper with Mario. He also gets tons of talks in at QIP. So uh, that's what I did. So I'd like to thank my co-authors, you know, not only for their scientific input into this project, but also for this kind of magic touch that they have, which apparently boosts your probability of getting accepted. So this talk is about, uh, it's about another variation on uh, the work cost of processes in, um, in, in quantum thermodynamics and you know, new relations to information measures. And I'll get into more detail about what this thermodynamic capacity actually is in a moment. All right, this is my mandatory slide about thermodynamics and information. We've already heard some very nice talks this morning by Alvaro and Carlo, so I will be brief. You have these two fields. One is um, thermodynamics. On the other hand, you have information theory. And while, while they might seem very different fields, well, it turns out that they're actually closely related and they share some common concepts. Most glaringly, they share the concept of entropy. And it turns out that's not really a coincidence. They're uh, really kind of deep connections between the two fields. And you can already suspect that by looking at the, the type of uh, tasks that you have in these fields. For instance, if I want to compress a gas to a fraction of its volume, you could kind of already imagine that this is somewhat analogous to uh, trying to reset some memory to some pure state or to you know, compress data to some smaller fraction of, a, of, a, of the original bit string. All right, so this dates back for a, uh, for a while. Uh, already Sillard at the time thought about how a gas with a single particle could actually be interpreted as a bit of information. And if I put this gas of one particle into a box with a separator, if I know on which side of the box the particle is, I know the value of that bit. And I can use that information to extract a certain amount of work by letting the particle push onto this, uh, this separator, attaching a piston. And if you work out how much work you'd extract, that would be kt log 2. All right. You can do the reverse operation too. You can start with a bit that has an absolutely unknown value, compress this gas, and you're, you're back to a bit with a known value, but you've paid kt log 2 amount of work. So you can trade one bit of work for, like, sorry, you can trade kt log 2 work for one bit of information. Now, more generally, Landauer realized that uh, whenever you have any logical process that uh, that discards information. Whenever you have something that's logically irreversible, then you, there's a thermodynamic cost associated with that. You can't do that for free. All right, how do we go by uh, understanding this uh, connection in a more systematic way? Right? We'd like to analyze more complicated situations than a simple bit erasure. So the way we do that is, again, as presented this morning in the thermodynamic talks, is to come up with some form of framework that will uh, allow us to analyze what we're allowed to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to set a set of rules. We're going to see what, we're, what we can do with these rules. And that's called a resource theory. So the resource theory of thermal operations goes like this. We're allowed to bring in any ancilla that's in the thermal state. That's the first rule, the first thing that we're allowed to do. Second thing, we're allowed to do any unitary that commutes with a total Hamiltonian. That means any unitary that conserves energy. This is the kind of thing that you know, we expect from physics. And last thing is we're allowed to trace out any system that we're done using. So once we're finished with our heat bath or whatever, we're just, we can just trace it out and discard it. All right. Now, if you stare at these operations, you can say you can try to figure out mathematical characterizations of this, and you can come up with interesting notions like thermomajorization and so on. But there's actually another approach, which is to see that all of these operations actually conserve the thermal state, right? All of these things, whatever you do, the thermal state gets mapped to the thermal state. So why not just impose that as a rule? Uh, or the, so we can build this alternative framework. So that would be kind of framework two, in which uh, you allow anything that conserves the thermal state. Right? Think of that as just a technical simplification that will allow us to, um, to, uh, to better characterize what we're able to do on a technical level. Don't worry about that operator inequality here on my slide. Just think of it as preserving the thermal state. Uh, that's kind of something that's just more convenient to look at. All right, the other thing is we, we're interested in how much work we need to uh, invest into doing something like a process, right? And how do we quantify work? 
The way we're going to do that is by uh, considering an explicit additional system next to the system that we're interested in. And this system will have a particular structure in which we have a certain number of bits. It's going to be an array of bits. And a certain number of these bits are going to be maximally mixed. That's kind of what these wiggles there are supposed to mean. And the rest of the system is going to be in a pure state. And then we just have to keep track of how these bits, how many of these bits are pure and how many are of these are maximally mixed. And as that varies, we rem you remember from Siller's engine and Landauer's principle, we can trade one bit of information for a certain amount of work. So we can just think of that as how much work we're using in the process. So imagine if I have a process where the battery suddenly, I have more pure, I have more pure bits in there. I know that I've used, I've, um, I've extracted some work, for instance. All right. Now notice that actually, uh, this is kind of a, a, a side remark. This framework, I phrase it in terms of stuff that's only information theoretic. There's really the only place where really where um, uh, physics comes in is in defining what this g operator, which I define as gamma, is, which are these Gibbs weights. It, this is the Hamiltonian. This is really the only place where we put in actually units of energy, for instance, right? So like you could imagine applying this framework to any situation where you'd have a reason to limit an agent to a certain amount of certain set of operations which preserve a given operator. All right, and the second thing I'm going to do for simplicity is I'm going to count work in units of nats. So this is just fixing the units of energy. I don't want to carry around these betas. Oh, I hope you can read the green there. Is it fine? Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to fix the units of energy and say that just fix beta equal one and just think of it as, OK, I have a background temperature. I'm just counting an equivalent number of not bits, but nats. So just to drop another factor of log two. So it's just a uh, uh, convenience. All right. Now, we're interested in the work cost of processes, right? So imagine I have a process going from x to x prime. And um, uh, so the what we're going to do is we're going to you know, run through our framework. And this is something that, uh, for instance, uh, was at last QIP. Um, we're going to run through our framework. And what you get at the, um, at the end is a mathematical characterization of how much work you need to do the particular process exactly. So what happens is that it turns out that if you want to do this process E, you need an amount of work that's kind of the best coefficient you can put in front of this gamma, such that this operator inequality is satisfied. So if you can find this number w up there, this is an if and only if condition. So if you can find such a number so that so this, the optimal w you can put in this equation here, that's the minimal amount of work you'll need to spend in order to carry out this process with our framework. All right, like, let me give you an example. That was a little bit abstract. So imagine I want to do Landauer erasure. So I want to map two states onto the same zero state. And uh, well, let's just plug that in. And let's imagine the Hamiltonian is degenerate. That means the operator gamma is just the identity. So what happens is that if we plug into this equation here, we'll get, you know, both of these states are mapped to the same one. So we're going to get two times the projector onto the zero ket. And well, the best coefficient we could put in front of here to uh, make this uh, operator inequality tight is really just this coefficient of two. So that's how we get that log two is the amount of work you need to erase a bit. Now, if we restore the units of energy as we had them originally, this is KT log two. So we recover again the work cost of uh, Landau erasure. Now, all of this is not really physically relevant if you're looking at larger system sizes, because it's not robust to perturbations. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the standard trick in information theory. We're going to optimize over processes that are epsilon close to the one that give a result that's epsilon close to the one we actually want to carry out. So we have this input state sigma, right? I assume that we have a certain state we're interested in applying the process on. And we're going to kind of modify this formula here by saying we're allowed to do some t instead of a e that, uh, whose result when I act on this uh, input state in purification is going to be epsilon close to the ideal uh, version, right? So doing that actually gives you a new quantity. This thing is, is what we call the coherent relative entropy. Um, and right, then this, this is kind of, this relates basically the work cost of the process to some information theoretic measures, right? Now, let me kind of map out a little bit the different, pro, uh, the different situations we might be interested in, in terms of work cost. So let's, let's consider first a situation where I have a trivial Hamiltonian, H equals zero. You don't have to worry about different energy levels. So we know that the work cost 
of uh, doing this process is actually given by this conditional max entropy. That's just if you kind of rewrite what I had before in a specific way, you just, this expression comes out. Uh, so it's the conditional entropy of the environment system, which is a Steinspring relation of our process. And it's, um, it's, you should really interpret this as the amount of entropy that I'm dumping into the environment once I, from the point of view of the observer who finished the computation. All right, now, the, uh, if we look at this in, um, in, the, in the setting where I have many copies of the process, that's the IID limit, well, what we get is this thing co very conveniently transforms into the difference of uh, entropies from between the input and the output. So this is a way you can see of uh, how we can recover some kind of thermodynamic potential in some macroscopic limit. All right, now, a more interesting example is the case where the Hamiltonian is uh, non-trivial. So what happens there is, as I mentioned before, we have this kind of coherent relative entropy object. And in the IID limit, this guy goes to the difference of a different potential. This is now the free energy, right? And in our information theoretic uh, framework, you can just write that as just the relative entropy of whatever state you have relative to this gamma operator. All right, this, this, is, this is all stuff that's, uh, been, that has been known. But now, what if I'm interested in feeding into the device any possible input state? What if I want to build an implementation in my quantum chip that works for whatever state the user would like to feed into that chip? That's something we haven't answered yet in, in, uh, in, the, in this uh, slide. So this is really what the question I'm going to address now at, in this talk. So already you can imagine the single shot scenario uh, we could do the same thing as before, right? Instead of just requiring the process to be accurate on the sigma, let's require it to be accurate for any possible input state. And it turns out that's actually what you can do, and it's kind of straightforward. But now the question is, what, what, becomes the, what is now the IID rate of doing something like that? Well, if you stare at this a little bit, you can kind of come up with, an, with a guess, which you can imagine. Well, let's just optimize over the input states and take the worst case over all possible input states. You can imagine like a universal implementation would simply have to pay amount of work that corresponds to the worst possible input, case, input state. And it turns out basically that this is going to be correct. So let me kind of uh, be a little more specific about what our main technical result is. So we do exactly as before. We, uh, have, we have this optimization where instead of optimizing over all channels that act correctly on this specific input state, we optimize over channels that are close in this diamond norm. And the diamond norm is, as probably most of you know, uh, this uh, measure of the uh, distance measure between channels that basically allow you to ensure that the channel is acting accurately for any possible input state. All right, you do that, that's a semi-definite program. You can kind of play around with it. Uh, it's nice. But now the question is, what does that become in the IID limit? And this is kind of our, non -tech our technical contribution here, is we show that this quantity actually goes to this, to this difference of relative entropies optimized over all possible input states. Now, this thing up here, th that's what we call the thermodynamic capacity. Right? It's kind of, we define it that way. And, um, and uh, so this is kind of analogous to uh, capacity in the sense, it's a kind of an information measure associated with the channel that does not depend on the input state. We actually have two versions of this result. One is exactly the one I mentioned here, right? If we write this down, we use our Gibbs Reserving Maps framework, and uh, we take and we calculate the IID limit. This is what we get. That's version one of our result, and version two of our result is, you know, I told you this, these Gibbs Preserving Maps were kind of a technical simplification of thermal operations, but you know, since I'm trying to show you that there actually exists an implementation of this. I'm kind of cheating here because, you know, if you want an implementation, it's better to have a framework in which we have operations that we think are reasonably implementable in some reasonable thermodynamic framework. So our second version of our result is going to be an implementation not using Gibbs preserving maps, but using thermal operations, which are kind of this more physical set of rules that we had imposed at the beginning of this talk. And well, actually, here though, there's a caveat. Uh, so this actually only works for time covariant channels. That's why we have kind of the, the two uh, versions of our result. All right, now let me, before I go into gory details, uh, let me kind of say two words about the thermo thermodynamic capacity. So it's this quantity here. First of all, it's not obvious from the definition, but it actually turns out that it's a convex optimization. You can write it out. What you do, I mean, if you can see this, it's like to write this as a conditional entropy using the Steinspring relation, and the conditional entropy is concave. So you can see that this is basically a, it is a convex optimization, so you can compute it efficiently on example channels. 
The other thing is that it's additive. And that can be kind of surprising because most times when you write down uh, some kind of information measure for a channel, it is everything but, it's like not additive at all. But here we're lucky. It actually is additive, and that was already noted in this earlier work by Navasquez and Garcia Pintos. Uh, then it has some interesting relation to information measures. This is, in a certain way, if you, if you plug in the identity here instead of gamma, you see that this is really the difference of entropy that the channel incurs. And this is, uh, this is something that's also interesting in its own, in its own right, to under understand what this quantity means, the, the entropy difference of a channel. And also has other interesting connections with other recent works, like the entropy of a channel, as defined by Gore and Wilde, and also the amortized entanglement, as defined by Kaur and Wilde. All right, now, I believe the expression coined earlier this week was, buckle up, this might get a little technical. So, um, we want to come up with a universal implementation with Gibbs preserving maps uh, of, um, of, uh, of this, of our uh, ideal process. So if we write down the problem we had before, we had these two conditions to satisfy, right? We wanted a process T that has this work cost. Remember, this was the condition that told us what the work cost of a process was. And we want to satisfy this diamond norm condition. We want our implementation to be close to the uh, IID channel. All right. Now, Let's look at the first condition. Let's, first of all, just dilate everything into an environment. And instead of trying to come up with a T, we'll try to come up with a W. That's, OK, just a rewrite. Uh, the next thing is we're going to use an ansatz. We're going to try to find a W that's of the form. We first apply the ideal process E, the, the dilated version of E, right? So this V isometry is here, just the Steinspring dilation of E. So we're first going to apply that, and then we're going to act with some operator M that hopefully we'll have to guess later. All right, now let's plug that into our condition here. And we see that we need uh, this condition right here. We need the M operator applied onto the uh, you know, gamma going through the Steinspring dilation. This thing, if you partial trace the environment, has to be operator less than kind of some, something related to the thermodynamic capacity. It has to have some kind of normalization with respect to these gamma operators. Just think of it that, that way. All right, so that's one condition we need to satisfy. The other one is this diamond norm condition. So here we're lucky because we have some um, very interesting results that are known about how to bound this diamond norm. And um, more, more specifically, we use this post-selection technique. And that's actually really powerful because that tells you essentially that you don't have to worry about feeding in any possible input state. You only have to test this condition over IID states, essentially, up to you know, lots of details and stuff like that. So what we really need to show is that, if you plug in now our ansatz in this W, what we need to show is that this M operator that we still left undefined, this thing basically has to act as a gentle measurement over the Steinspring dilated input uh, for any possible IID input. All right? So these are the two conditions we need to satisfy. All right. Now, time-wise, OK. Um, so um, what happens is that, this, if you, if you stare at these conditions, I mean, this screams typical projectors, right? You want some kind of typical projector here. So uh, let's go shopping for typical projectors. Uh, you have the usual typical, typical, typical projector. That's kind of not good enough yet because it depends on the state. It's not sensitive to this bipartite nature of the state. And it's not relative to these gamma operators. So we need something a little more involved. You know, you've got these relative typical projectors. Those are great. And, um, but they, again, still, they, def they depend on this input state. So they still not exactly do what we want. So you could look at other, again, typical projectors, which are universal. And that's great. But now it turns out they're not, un they're not relative anymore. So um, well, you can kind of uh, look at what, it, what kind of typical projectors exist. And um, we actually came up with our own custom-made uh, conditional, relative, whatever, universal, typical. And it's not a projector, it's an operator, uh, but who cares? Uh, so <laughs> the idea is that uh, it, it's an operator M that depends only, that does not depend on the state, but only on these gamma operators. And this operator M basically behaves kind of like a projector uh, in the sense that it's normalized uh, by uh, the identity. And it has this normalization condition with these gammas. If you apply it to this bipartite gamma EB for whatever you know, gamma we chose here, um, if you, partial, if you take the partial trace over one system, it's going to be normalized in a certain way by some, uh, by some number that we fixed uh, and on which this M operator depends. All right, And also this M also acts as a gentle measurement for any possible IID state that's, that obeys this uh, condition on the relative entropy. 
All right, but in any case, if you remember the two conditions that we had before, well, actually, these are exactly the conditions that we need uh, from uh, our new, uh, if, that are given to us by this new kind of typical operator. All right, so that allows us to complete the construction of the universal implementation in one case. And, and so now let me go to the, to the second implementation I mentioned, the one with thermal operations. Now this one, I'll, I'll try to do it into two steps. So the first step is to uh, come up with a protocol to erase a system conditioned on a memory. So this is something that was already uh, considered in, in, uh, in, uh, by Lydia uh, earlier, um, a few years ago. And we're going to use a new technique that's called this convex split that was, uh, uh, that was introduced in, among, in a series of work among which this one. All right, so the task is we have a bipartite state. We would like to bring the system S into a pure state or to some reference state while possibly exploiting any information that we might have in M about the state of S. All right, now the first thing we're going to do is, uh, so according to this convex split construction, we're going to bring in a huge bunch of ancillas that are all copies of the system S but they're all uh, kind of all in the thermal state. And we're also gonna bring in a register here of a certain dimensionality M that we're gonna fix later. All right, after that, we're gonna use the value that's given to us here, conditioned on this value here, we're gonna swap the system S into one of these ancillas, right? So we're gonna do that coherently. So if I have a value J here, my system will now be will now be swapped into the jth ancilla here, and it will be, you know, so again, we'll still have the same state with correlated state between AJ and the memory M. Now, the interesting part and the, uh, the very clever part uh, realization of this kind of construction uh, is that, uh, that, so this construction of the uh, convex split is the realization that but actually, only by looking at these systems, you don't have to look at the memory register J. Only by looking at these systems, you can kind of figure out where I hid the system if M is not too large. And the answer is like, it, it, the kind of tech, you can see it like this. If, you can, if there's an operator pi that can successfully do this hypothesis test between the bipartite state rho SM and just a gamma tensor rho M, like if I, if I check whether I can kind of test whether I'm here or not, and if I can do this hypothesis test successfully with these parameters, then I can kind of come up with a POVM or a POVM on, on, that acts only on these systems, which tells me where I hid the system, right? And well, what we can think of is, well, okay, let's just reset the memory uh, J, let's reset, sorry, the uh, register J by acting kind of conditionally on this measurement outcome in, certain, in a certain way, in a, again, in a coherent way. Uh, then we, we're essentially kind of resetting this uh, register back to zero. And now if we squint at this, we realize that we just did a thermal operation with a battery, right? We had a bunch of thermal states, that's our bath. We had our battery here, a bunch of uh, mixed qubits. And we did something, a huge unitary that turns out conserved energy. And uh, then we're left with a heat bath which we can discard. And we've gone from a mixed state to a pure state. So this is really work extraction. So as long as we can satisfy, as long as we can find a projector here that satisfies these conditions, we can do work extraction and reset the memory to some reference states here, which is in this case just a thermal state. All right, now let's use this for our universal construction of uh, any process. So what we're gonna do is we're simply gonna uh, do this Steinspring dilation of the ideal process first, right? Um, and once we did that, we're gonna do exactly as before. We're gonna you know, bring in the bunch of ancillas, we're gonna swap in uh, the, the system in one of the ancillas condition on whatever random stuff we had in there. And now comes the dark magic, you know, you invoke the right demons and they give you, as, 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 again, an operator pi that's based on Schorweil duality that successfully and universally distinguishes an IID state, an, a bipartite IID state from this gamma tensor n tensor rho, uh, kind of rho x prime or rho m in this case, tensor n. And well, it turns out that the relevant m, guess what? It's the thermodynamic capacity, all right? So we just c continue as we did before, right? We kind of conditionally on this outcome uh, reset the register. And um, uh, this again is a thermal operation and you know, we get to extract the, th we get to uh, use the thermodynamic capacity in this implementation. Right, so let me summarize a little bit uh, what happened here. 
so we have two implementations, one using GIPS preserving maps, the other, the other one using uh, thermal operations. The second one is restricted to time covariant operations, uh, but it's more physical because we're using a set of operations that are kind of better motivated in, in terms of implementing them. All right, now we've got um, kind of the related task that we can also consider, right? Imagine I give you a black box access to n copies of a channel, and I ask you to extract as much work as you can. Well, you can do that simply by, you know, feeding in the best possible input to the state that will give you the best energy difference. And, well, that's again exactly the uh, thermodynamic capacity, right? So if, you, if you're given black box access to the channel, you can extract from that channel the thermodynamic capacity in, um, in terms of work. So this was a question that was uh, studied in this earlier work. All right, now let's, if we put this together with what we had before, we get an interesting picture for the resource theory of channels. So imagine we have a resource theory of channels uh, and we want to interconvert them with thermodynamic operations. Well, we've seen that, uh, oh yeah, first of all, in resource theories, usually we like to look at the IID case because it makes things simpler. Uh, so imagine we have a bunch of copies of E's and we want to map those to a bunch of copies of F's. So we've seen, uh, from what we've seen before, we can do that in the following way. From E, we just extract as much energy as we can, and then we just simulate F uh, using you know, our uh, implementation. Um, our, universal, our universal implementation. And if you do that, you get the work cost of you know, T of F minus T of E. Uh, now notice that because of the reverse um, operation that I just presented, you can, do the, uh, you can go the other way too. So, so like, yeah, I mean, I mean you, we use both, I guess, in both directions. But the point is to going from one way to going from E's to a bunch of F's or going from a bunch of F's to a bunch of E's uses exactly the opposite um, resource cost. So the amount of work you need to go one way, you get it back going the other way. Uh, so that means that the resource theory is, re is reversible. And that's interesting because you know, it's not often that resource theories are reversible. It's kind of a nice property to have for resource theories. Or if you're used to kind of thinking of uh, conversion rates, you can also write in terms of conversion rates. It doesn't really matter. We've got a couple of bonus results. Um, you know, we've uh, kind of side results while deriving the stuff that I just presented. Um, we have a new, a new way of proving the asymptotic equipartition property of the coherent relative entropy. We have, uh, an, uh, what was that? Uh, yeah, if we have, if we fix the inputs and um, uh, we want to do a specific process, then we also have an implementation for that. We also have a one-shot, actually, a one-shot implementation for, with thermal operations of any possible uh, time covariant uh, process with fixed input. All right, so those are kind of side results that are uh, bonus results. So let me, um, ha let me uh, make some general remarks at this point. We have, first of all, the the, the, our result is pretty analogous to that, the one of the reverse Shannon theorem. So, you know, if you want to uh, simulate a, uh, what's kind of the cost of simulating a channel uh, if, if two parties share entanglement. And again, uh, our proof is kind of similar in spirit to that one. But an interesting thing is if we try to imitate that proof by Mario using only entropy measures, it kind of fails. So we kind of do need to use all of these constructions with typical projectors and everything. Uh, now, this thermodynamic capacity is also an interesting quantity because it's additive and it's kind of uh, okay to work with. And we use some interesting properties, some interesting new properties on um, uh, information theoretic, you know, convex split, post-selection, typical projectors, and it kind of nicely fits into other contexts of information theory uh, measures recently introduced for channels. Now, <clears throat> let me conclude with uh, kind of what did we do? We basically showed that you can implement a, a channel optimally in the IID regime with a rate that's the thermodynamic capacity. Right, now that's interesting because for the resource tier of channels because it means it's reversible. And well, you know, it's, uh, now the questions you can ask is, well, if I have a, if, can I get kind of this missing gap that I had between the two results? Can I get a universal implementation with thermal operations of any possible channel? Well, our guess is that you'd actually need a huge reference frame in order to do that. Much like in the rever reverse Shannon theorem, you actually need uh, a, t a huge embezzling state in order to actually do that uh, properly. And then it also relates to interesting work about, uh, interesting new work on channel smoothing. So with that, thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, Philip. Any questions for Philip? Yes. Thanks for a nice talk. Um, I was wondering about the 
universal relative typical projector. Seems like a really nice tool, and you use it in thermodynamics. Do you have a sense of uh, whether it could be used in other resource theories, like what properties of the resource theory you would need in order to use it? That's a good question. I haven't thought about it that much. Uh, of course, in any situation, any resource theory where, where you have a state that has to be conserved by evolution, by definition, you know, just by definition of our framework, uh, would go through. So, you know, it's you can imagine at least in, on paper, it's kind of more general than thermodynamics. But um, I don't have a go-to example of another situation where we could imagine this is useful. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. I haven't thought about it. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I was wondering if you can comment. Yeah, if you can comment a bit more on the similarities or the difference with the reverse uh, Shannon theorem, because you said like one particular proof doesn't work for this. Right. Uh, so, in the reverse Shannon theorem, right, you're you kind of have also this uh, this setting where you need to. Um, you need to show that you need to come up with an implementation that's close to an IID uh, to many copies of a given channel, right? You need to come up with some implementation with a certain protocol, right? Um, with certain rules like uh, arbitrary shared, shared entanglement and so on. That's close to your target IID state. Now, uh, like the, the comment that I made is that Mario actually has a pretty nice proof of that theorem, going through one-shot information theory, going through definite, definite reduction, writing everything relatively quickly, you write basically just the entropy measure associated with that, and then you do manipulation on the level of the entropy measure. So you don't have to worry about the actual implementation. You just kind of bound the entropy measures. You say that, uh, I mean, there are a couple technical steps that I mean, I'm happy to illustrate to you uh, offline. There are a couple technical steps that, you go, that are on the level of the entropy measures. You don't have to worry about the implementation that much. And well, it turns out that one of those steps that you need is some kind of quasi-convexity of the conditional, of what would be here the conditional relative entropy. So in, in Mario's case, I think it's uh, mutual information or something like that. But here, because we have this different quantity, it, that's the place where it actually breaks down. Um, so is, the question is, is it, is it something fundamental or is it something really just to this particular proof? Um, I think the, my take home message out of that is really kind of this entropy measure, this coherent relative entropy is not quasi-convex as you would need it in the, other, uh, in the other context. So in this sense, it's kind of particular to this proof, uh, but it also kind of is interesting because, you know, I don't know, you might have expected it is and it turns out that it isn't. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Any more questions? I, I actually have one. Um, sure. So your, your W epsilon quantity is, is somehow a max relative entropy in disguise, right? A little bit. When you, the, if you go back to the... If I go back to my um, definition, this one here? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's... Um, d d it there, is, should be, there should be a relation to the, the right. oh, max yeah. relative entropy, right? Right, so actually, it turns out that this guy is Sorry, this guy can be written actually in some way as a as a max relative entropy of channels, like a channel max relative entropy. Exactly, so that's then, absolutely correct. So actually, at the Beyond IID conference, Andreas, you know, asked me yeah. about this, and uh, it turns out that this is there's a caveat. It's they're the same as long as it costs work, but if you're in terms of extracting work, this guy will become negative, but uh, the relative entropy difference to the free states is going to be zero because it's already the state the sorry the free channels is going to be zero because the channel is already free. Okay. So up to that caveat, they're actually the same. Yeah. And then your result is somehow a special case of an AEP result for that max relative entropy of channels, right? Yeah, I, yeah. yeah, you could put it that way. That's right. That's right. Okay. Any more questions for Philip? If not, then let's thank him again. Thanks.